Welcome to the mind. What do we really mean by genius? Matters. Giftedness is so much more than an academic label. Podcast. We tend to think of gifted as kids being good at everything across the board. An exploration of giftedness. Originals are nonconformists. Creativity. People who not only have new ideas. Intelligence. They're the people you want to bet on. In childhood. I like to learn about things, but I like to learn my way. And beyond. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. It's episode 31, guys. I'm Emily Kircher Morris, and today we'll be talking about the growing problem of fake news. The term fake news has reached a prominent place in the global lexicon today, but the phenomenon isn't new. What is new is the ease with which it spreads through social media and other electronic forums. Pretty much everyone has an instant connection to pretty much everyone else in their pocket right now. So how do we prepare for this growing threat in an online world that blurs the line between fact and fiction? Fueled by subversive motivations, an entire dark industry is trying to steer public opinion and manipulate the masses. But there is no opposite industry to fight back. So the fight has to begin at the individual level by teaching our kids how to know what's fake and what's not. In a minute, we'll hear from Dr. Brian Hausen, who wrote a book called Fighting Fake News. So stay with us. So we need a favor. We realize that there are about a million ways to find podcasts today. iTunes and Google Podcasts are big ones, but there are dozens or hundreds of podcast apps and platforms to choose from. The favor we need is this. If wherever you found our app has a rating or review feature, would you just take one minute and give us a thumbs up or write us a positive review? And of course, please subscribe. It's amazing how much reviews and subscriptions help boost visibility, and that's exactly what we need right now. Thanks for your help. Also, if you're on Twitter, follow us at Mind Matters Pod, and on Facebook or Instagram, just search Mind Matters Podcast. We promise not to share any fake news with you. Our guest today... Hello, this is Brian Housen. I'm currently the program coordinator of the academically and intellectually gifted program at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, and I'm the author of Fighting Fake News. Stay with us. If what you hear on Mind Matters makes a difference to you and your family, consider becoming a supporter. Through Patreon.com, you can chip in to help defray the cost of producing this podcast. Just decide how much you'd like to contribute, and that amount will be placed on your credit card every month. Even a couple of bucks would help cover the cost of producing the podcast and help us promote it to new listeners who could also use our help. Go to patreon.com slash mindmatters and become a patron. And thanks for making a difference. The term fake news is on the tip of everyone's tongue these days, but fake news is hardly new. With us is Brian Hausen, who has written a book called Fighting Fake News. And so, Brian, why don't you start us off by giving us a little historical perspective? Sure. Well, I think that with the history of fake news is something that has probably been around a lot longer than we would um, care to admit. Uh, Certainly, we could go back to um, sort of the beginning of time and think about where it is that we got our our news from in the very beginning. Typically, this would rely on uh, merchants or people that were kind of travelers going out into the world and, you know, finding these um, things that actually existed or um, these sort of mythical sea creatures that were out there. If we think about fake news within, um, within America, uh, certainly, it's probably been around um, as long as the, the U.S. colonies have been here. We can certainly go back to the, the time of our founding fathers and, and look at how they, uh, they themselves were creators of fake news. Uh, it's been reported that, um, that Ben Franklin himself would concoct these propaganda stories about murderous scalping Indians working in league with the British to um, sort of incite sort of this uh, revolutionary fervor. If we move forward into uh, into the 1800s and really the rise of newspapers uh, across the country, uh, we saw also the rise in fake news. Uh, one sort of famous story about this uh, occurred in August of 1835, where the New York Sun published a series of articles that ran over a period of, uh, of an entire week. Now, the Sun told the story of famed astronomer Sir John Herschel 
who had apparently invented this colossal telescope that allowed him to see life on the moon. Mm. Now, it started out as, you know, a very much a real sounding story. But by the third day, the sun began to report on the range of life that existed on the moon, including things like quadrupeds that were similar to bison, uh, a single horned goat of a bluish color, and this beaver that walked around on two legs and carried its young in its arms like a human. Uh, By day four, the sun started reporting of the existence of human-like creatures with wings and the ability to fly. Incidentally, the sun actually benefited from an increase in subscriptions and ad revenue because of the reporting of fake news. Now, if we go forward um, as technology advances and we move from newspapers to then uh, radio news, uh, we hear sort of that famous story of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on-air performers. Uh, On the day of October 30th, 1938, there is the radio program that we have probably all heard of at this point, and that was their adaptation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Now, we've all heard the stories about how this radio program caused mass panic across the country, Um, although the scale of that panic now within the 21st century is certainly questionable. It's also questionable whether that event even occurred at all. Mm. And a a telephone survey that was conducted um, the day after, uh, they called 5,000 households at random across the country. And it was reported that less than 2% of them uh, had reported listening to the War of the Worlds program during uh, that one hour radio time. Instead, the people that did report listening to the radio at that time uh, were listening to what was the most popular radio program of the day. Uh, That was the Chase and Sanborn Radio Hour. This featured uh, Edgar Bergen and and Charlie McCarthy, uh, whose names you might recognize as um, a very famous ventriloquist. You know, honestly, I'm not even exactly sure how that works. Um, (laughs) The newspapers were certainly quick to point out that it was causing this mass uh, panic with headlines such as uh, that the radio play terrifies the nation. So in exactly the same way that we're hearing sort of all of these cries of fake news, uh, the newspapers of the 1930s uh, were really afraid of um, radio coming into play and sort of taking their market share. As we came to sort of the turn of this past century and really looking at how we're living in this age and time of a 24 hour a day, seven day a week news cycle where news really has become less of news and perhaps more of entertainment. Mm -hmm. It's further complicated by the fact that now thanks to internet technologies and social media, anyone anywhere has the power to report the news and to say pretty much anything it is that they want. So um, we have more outlets, more venues for the news. uh, And we, I think, really are at this state of the game where we have to be even more critical than we've ever been before of what we're uh, interacting with and what it is that we choose to believe. There's just so much information. And so what's even worth you know, researching and what's just worth, you know, discounting. Um, and it gets really kind of exhausting. Yeah, I would say um, exhausting is a is a really great term for that. I think in a lot of ways, we'll sort of leave our interaction with the news feeling that we have been informed uh, when in fact, we um, only just have enough information to be slightly dangerous. Why is it so important to train our kids to be more vigilant about sifting real news from fake news? And beyond that, how do you think it ties in with our gifted population? Yeah, I mean, I think that we as teachers and as parents have always been working towards um, helping our students and our kids with the ability to tell fact from fiction. Uh, I was a former elementary um, classroom teacher and then a teacher of the gifted. We have to, I think, just um, almost double down on teaching that that fact from fiction. Not only the like fiction from nonfiction piece, but oftentimes within so-called nonfiction resources, then there's a lot of fiction that goes along with that. Mm-hmm. We have to be incredibly critical consumers of the information that we're interacting with. Uh, we also, I think, as part of this, have to teach our kids and even ourselves as adults not only to be critical consumers of the information that we're interacting with, but responsible producers. So that when we are sharing things online, when we are sharing things with our friends or family, uh, our classmates, that we're thinking about what it is that we are sharing. If we're taking uh, information that we've heard from other folks, we have to sort of pass it through our truth detector uh, and see if that's something that is worth sharing or whether it's, you know, kind of idle gossip or or rumors. Uh, Also, when we're posting things online, uh, we have to think about as we're creating new 
information or as we're creating new research, uh, we have to be responsible in what it is that we're sharing. As I would often tell my students, we want to be really careful that we're not using our genius for evil. (laughs) Right. So what are some of the common mistakes that you see when you are working with students and they're researching online and evaluating information? Where do you see that gap occurring? Yeah, so when I was in in grad school um, at the University of Connecticut, uh, I was working uh, on my PhD in in gifted education and then also in instructional technology. And I got the opportunity to work with um, Don Liu, who's a professor at UConn and heads up the the new literacies research team. This was really the first time that this kind of idea of thinking critically in online environments or fighting fake news um, really came to my attention. And so what we did as part of this research study was to um, watch middle school students conduct internet searches. So these uh, this group of um, probably about 40 or 50 uh, middle school students were given this task to go and find um, some different pieces of information. Uh, so they used a variety of different search engines and they had to compose their own search terms and they had to go through this whole process. It was both Uh, incredibly enlightening uh, and mind-numbing at the same time to watch these like 50 to 60 (laughs) hours of video uh, screen captures of middle school students searching for things uh, on the web. I learned just so much in in that process. And uh, since then, I've become like such a critical viewer of watching other people um, search for things on the internet. Mm. Uh, You realize that that search process is something that is um, that's very personal. Everybody has their um, sort of strategy or lack of strategies that they um, that they go through. As I watched, um, really poor searching, uh, oftentimes it begins with just a series of really bad search terms. Uh, whether you're looking for something that's uh, that's so incredibly vague um, or uh, overly specific, in that you're typing in uh, an exact question. A lot of times, um, just the words that you put within your search terms can be huge distractors for the type of information that um, that you get back. That's sort of mistake number one. Mistake number two really comes from this idea that the thought process of many of our gifted kids have conditioned them to think they can find information quickly and easily. Many of our gifted kids conflate the idea that what SMART is about is how quickly and easily it is that you can do something. Uh, The faster you can do it, the easier that you can do it, the smarter you are. And the internet just sort of reinforces that. Exactly. Mistake number three is that um, we tend to click on the first items that are on the list without reading that, um, that snippet view that is right there. Better searchers will look at the snippet view, see if that um, that sort of brief synopsis uh, provides some key information for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say that the biggest mistake of all would be that they're not comparing their results with other sources, uh, that they're simply getting that answer from one single source uh, and not saying, is this piece of information something that's being reported uh, by other folks as well? One of the things that you've done sometimes in some of your presentations you'll kind of quiz the people who are there about some headlines. And I think they're always real headlines, but they're not necessarily real news. Is that how you kind of frame that with them? Yep. yep. I'm a little nervous about this because I'm worried that I'm going to sound really dumb. But let's go for it. What, what, what headlines do you have for me? And I'll see if I can tell if they're real or fake just from the headline. So I've got three headlines that I, that I chose. You can ask any follow-up questions if you want some additional information. That's always, uh, you know, kind of a, a good good way to go about it. Okay. Uh, so headline number one, the world is running out of sand. There's even a violent black market for it. Oh, I think this is a real headline. Yeah, this is. Because a- I think there's like the thing with the sand that they've been using for the concrete in China. So this actually is, um, this is a real headline, real story. So the headline came from uh, a news organization called Global News. Uh, it's a, a Canadian news agency. Um, but if you checked or verify this piece of information with uh, with other news agencies or just search for global sand shortage. This apparently is a real story. It's being reported by uh, a variety of different news outlets. All right. Good job. <laughs> All right. Uh, headline number two, swatting at mosquitoes can teach them not to bug you. That seems like it would be could be real. Okay, so you said I could ask follow-up questions. Can I ask you what resource that came from? So I pulled this headline from a, uh, from a website called newsatlas.com. I'm going to go with fake. I don't think that's real. I don't think that's true. 
Now, apparently, this is uh, this is also a real story. Huh. Uh, so there's been some uh, some research that's been conducted by some scientists at the University of Washington, uh, where they are, have um, found that if you swat at mosquitoes, then that apparently it will train them to um, sort of recognize your scent, uh, and that they realize that going near this scent um, is going to cause me to get swatted at, so I should perhaps avoid that. So it'll train them to stay away from the SWAT and then it will, and then they won't come by you because they'll recognize your smell? They will uh, remember the trained odors, uh, apparently for days. Really? Well, this is great for me because I am very sensitive to mosquito bites. Good. Awesome. Okay, what's the third one? <laughs> uh, so, we have, uh, so we have one final one here. The headline says, a lot of parents are naming their babies Kylo. <laughs> <laughs> after the new villain in the Star Wars films. Mm, a lot of new parents. I don't know. That seems probably true. Probably. <laughs> I just am assuming. You're, you're assuming. It's like, there are a lot of Star Wars fans out there. Yeah, yeah so this was, uh, this was a story reported in, a, a, again, a variety of different locations. Uh, I pulled this headline from the LA Times. Wow. Apparently in uh, 2016, uh, 238 um, Social Security card applicants named Kylo... Uh, as their baby's name, <laughs> and making it the 901st most popular boy's name for 2016. I was very skeptical of uh, of that piece of information, so I did a little digging myself. <laughs> so um, you will be happy to know that Kylo from 2016 to 2017 was one of the biggest drops in baby names. <laughs> uh, and so it did drop down to uh, the 1,149th most popular uh, boy's name for 2017. So no longer in the top 1,000 there. No longer in the top 1,000. <laughs> I think that this is something that, that teachers could definitely do with their kids, too, and kind of have those types of discussions, you know, and just because something either seems real or seems fake, you have to kind of do that deeper searching to find out, you know, what's really behind it. Let's talk about, you know, when you talk to teachers about how they can work with kids, what are the criteria that you recommend for them to really talk to students about evaluating those sources for accurate information? So what I did for, for the Fighting Fake News book is that I looked for something that was going to be memorable for the teachers and for the students. And so I looked around at a lot of different uh, existing frameworks that are out there and sort of synthesized them down into something that um, that really I felt worked well for, um, for elementary and middle school students. Uh, and I called that framework CAPES really kind of building on this idea of um, becoming a, a superhero or becoming a, a, a super critical thinker in an online environment. So CAPES is divided into five different categories. Credentials, uh, looking at the accuracy of the information, the purpose for that information, your emotional response to the piece of information that you have, and then um, looking at what support is available for the information that you're encountering. So the C is credentials, which means you should consider the source and the reputation, correct? Yeah, precisely. So with the credential piece, we're looking at um, a couple, couple of things. Number one, we're looking at um, what is the source of the information? Uh, what is the website that you're getting this from? Is it a reputable news agency? Uh, is it coming off of a blog? Um, you know, if you're finding it on Facebook or Twitter, uh, is it linking to um, another source? Uh, wh what is that source? What's the background of that piece, that source of information? Uh, the second piece then um, not only is who is this news agency, if it's a news agency, but who is the author of that information? So we might look at it from this uh, sort of institutional or more global standpoint, as well as uh, the individual person. Do they have any background or expertise in the area or on that subject? Are they simply giving their own opinions of that piece of information? We really need to um, find out what other things that person has also said uh, and reported on in order to get a better understanding of what qualifies them to be an expert. Next is A, which stands for accuracy. Uh, so we're looking for things like, um, is this information uh, up to date? Is it factual? So when we're talking about um, news items, we want to have the most up-to-date information as possible. Uh, if we're thinking about more like, you know, historical events or we're looking at historical research, we might not necessarily need the most up-to-date information uh, for that. Uh, we need to look at what evidence is being provided. Uh, are they just making, uh, making a claim? Are they actually giving us some sort of background um, piece of information? Are there any pieces of information that seem to be missing? So um, is there something that they're not telling us? 
in order to create a more positive spin. And so I think that we really have to dig deeper into that and simply not accept uh, the information as it's being presented, but always think about just what's behind the headline or what is it that's just behind the news that's being reported on. The next letter is P, which stands for purpose. But under the heading of purpose, you use sort of a sub-acronym here, PIES. What does PIES represent? Is the author of this, um, this news story trying to persuade us? Uh, is it I trying to uh, inform us about something? Or is it E trying to entertain us? Or is it S trying to sell us something, which is really what many things on the internet are trying to do? So looking at this information through the pies lens can really help um, inform us how much weight we should be giving to um, this information. Obviously, if it's uh, written for information purposes, then uh, we're going to um, be more willing to give our trust to that versus if it's obviously written for entertainment purposes, uh, then we would be giving uh, less trust to that. Uh, persuasion offers its sort of own flavor uh, of, of the pie uh, for us to take a look at. And if we are being marketed to or trying to be sold a product, uh, then we need to um, exercise uh, caution as we're proceeding. And so the E of capes is emotion. And I know this is one that I see so often on social media where people are sharing things based on emotion that don't have a whole lot behind them. I think that we're so driven by our, our emotion. And if we would just pause even for two seconds uh, before we think about having an internet war uh, with uh, with our friends and family <laughs> or, you know, hitting hitting repost on uh, on Twitter or on Facebook, we could solve so many problems. You know, we just need to have that moment to say, hey, how does this item make me feel? Uh, I pulled on uh, Robert Pluchik's uh, theory of the eight basic emotions, joy versus sadness, anger versus fear, anticipation versus surprise, and disgust versus trust. A lot of times as we're interacting with, uh, with news items or as we're um, reading stories, uh, we will feel a combination of a number of these emotions. Uh, and certainly... Uh, even just having sort of those eight listed there uh, can begin to help us look at that information with, uh, with a more critical eye. Yeah. And so the last letter of CAPES is S, which is support. Just that, looking for what supporting information can you, um, can you find out there. And just as we have always been taught by our teachers and librarians and media specialists, we need to use more than one source of information, uh, especially when we're doing some type of research project. I can remember, you know, really very vividly, like my fourth grade teacher telling me, Brian, you are going to have to use more than the World Book Encyclopedia for this report. <laughs> Wait, I have to use other books that are out there? Uh, we need to encourage them not to just use that that one website that they're going to uh, when they're looking for information online. You know, can you find um, the same piece of information in two or three other places so that we're beginning to really triangulate that, that data and come to something that is um, possibly closer to the truth rather than relying on just what one person is saying about this? So are we making progress against fake news? I mean, it's certainly not going away. If anything, it's just a growing phenomenon. So give us a forecast. Yeah, I mean, I think that we um, that we are making progress. Uh, I think that um, really having a conversation about it uh, is definitely a great beginning. Uh, we certainly have this new level of awareness that is part of a conversation not only um, not only within classrooms, uh, but I think really a conversation on uh, on a national level. As we go th forward from here, I think that what's really important for us to keep in mind is that we must remain vigilant uh, within this. It's something that, um, as I said before, is something that with this great power comes this great responsibility, that we have to have conversations with, uh, with our kids, uh, with our students, about being those critical consumers. And we as adults have to be good role models for, um, for our own kids and for our own students. We as adults are some of the ones that are um, really the worst at this type of thing. Uh, and so we need to not only have those conversations with our kids, but we need to learn from them uh, as well. I would say that the final thing um, that I would advise um, or that I've learned through this process uh, of writing the uh, Fighting Fake News book uh, really comes down to, to three main points. Number one is that we should question everything. 
Uh, and by everything, I mean absolutely everything. Uh, so we need to at least pause for that moment in time uh, and think about what's their motivation? What's their, what's their bias behind saying this? Uh, number two, saying something is fake does not make it fake. The opposite of that um, is also true, which is point number three. Saying something is real does not make it real. If we just uh, accepted that as a fact or as a truth, uh, it would go a long way. Uh, as much as I want to believe in aliens and unicorns, uh, I really need to see some real proof um, and evidence um, before I'm willing to believe that in my heart of hearts. Dr. Brian Hausen, author of Fighting Fake News, thanks for your time. Thank you for having me. Stay with us. If what you hear on Mind Matters makes a difference to you and your family, consider becoming a supporter. Through Patreon.com, you can chip in to help defray the cost of producing this podcast. Just decide how much you'd like to contribute, and that amount will be placed on your credit card every month. Even a couple of bucks would help cover the cost of producing the podcast and help us promote it to new listeners who could also use our help. Go to Patreon.com slash Mind Matters and become a patron. And thanks for making a difference. This is the Mind Matters Podcast. The amount of information our kids are exposed to on a daily basis is exponentially greater than it was when you and I were kids. We had a newspaper in our house, but I was really just kind of a funnies person because Calvin and Hobbes and the Far Side were hilarious, but I didn't really have much use for the rest of the paper. So let's teach our kids what the phrase, a healthy dose of skepticism, means. They need to be able to look at that information objectively, whether it comes from social media or an internet search or friends talking on the back of the bus. We have to teach them to do their own research and to always be open to reframing their beliefs based on that new information. As long as they know how to tell if that information is accurate, they'll be better prepared for a more informed future in a world that'll likely include more fake news instead of less. I'm Emily Kircher Morse, and here are today's headlines ripped directly from the Twitterverse. <clears throat> IKEA plans to open future stores closer to convenient landfill locations. Kim Kardashian is retreating to a life of solitude, citing a spiritual awakening based on the teachings of Kanye. The new Avengers movie flops at the box office. Blame for the world population boom placed squarely on babies. The once thriving Cheeto faces a bleak future amid spreading legalization of cannabis. The parent company of the popular Fortnite game plans to close as the CEO asks, what the f are we doing with our lives? Podcast listeners definitely superior to every other person on earth. Thanks for listening. See you next time. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. When I woke up this morning, got the news on my lap. Rub my eyes in the confusion. Is it true? Is it real? Thanks to Dr. Brian Hausen. You can find his work at brianhausen.com. Thanks to Joe Remersa for his song, Fake News. You can find it, along with his other work, at his website, joeremersa.com. As always, you can check out the episode 31 page at mindmatterspodcast.com for links to everything. If you'd like to help keep us moving forward, consider making a monthly contribution at patreon.com slash mindmatters. The executive producer of Mind Matters is me, Dave Morris. And on behalf of everyone here, thanks for listening. Everything I know is a lie. Is that what you're telling me? I want to know who's in charge. Okay, I'll wait. There you go. Is there a number I can call? 
Mind Matters is a production of Morris Creative Services.